Welcome to the Football Show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. I'm your host, Adam Binney, joined by Alan Ruff and Neil Murray, once again standing in for the absent boss, Peter, who is still on his son lounger over in Portugal. We've got lots to get through today, but first we will talk about our competition this week, another fantastic competition. This week you have the opportunity to play golf with Tam McManus against our Ruffy and Frank McAvaney. Here's Ruffy and Tam telling you all about it. This week's competition is a chance for you to play a round of golf with Tam McManus against myself and Frank McAvenny. To enter, you must subscribe to PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel and answer this simple question. Which World Cup did Frank McAvenny and Alan Ruff both play in? Good luck. Good luck. Seems to be some confusion on the couch. Have we actually worked yeah. out where Peter is? Yes, he's certainly in the Algarve. He's uh, <laughs> actually a minus my tennis partner tonight. He's actually over and believe it or not, at a tennis course for five days. He's uh, there for the whole week and uh, be back obviously at the end of the week. But uh, obviously trying to improve his tennis. You know. So is that because you keep beating him? No, I would suggest he stays a wee while longer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe three weeks. <laughs> and a tennis now. Uh, no, I don't play it, and when I have tried it, it's pretty difficult, so uh, I'll give it a miss. <laughs> yeah, we've got a, a quiz question for our lovely viewers this afternoon, and it is, which two teams contested the highest scoring Champions League final ever? That's on screen now for you. Lads, any guesses? Start with yourself, Neil. Any idea when that might have been, which two teams might have played? Nope. Ruffy? The, the, the only one I can think is a Liverpool on 6-3-3. About to be, oh, I'll be what about a way, 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 way back? Well, it could be a way, 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 but Real Madrid, nine tracks, seven, well, three. The, 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 is it could be that? Including the question, or is it Champions the League Champions rather than League European Cup? Oh, it includes, it's, it's forever, so it includes European Cup and oh, right, Champions okay. League. So you're so probably could, talking that was it Ein track, uh, Frankfurt, Real Madrid? So. Seven, three, yeah, unless there was something else hanging about, we don't know about. Well, we'll review the answer at the end of the show and see if Ruffy and Neil have it correct. But first topic, we need to talk about the news coming out this afternoon that Police Scotland are investigating the messages sent to Old Firm referee Kevin Clancy in the wake of the Old Firm derby at the weekend. They were just talking to you um, there in the office and on the preview. It's really just not great. Again, we, we read out in the show yesterday the statement from, from the, the SFA, but the treatment of the res referees, no, ma no matter their performance, it's, it's just disgraceful. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, Kevin Clancy, did he really have a particularly bad game? Probably not. There was one decision that's a big decision that he takes, which uh, angers one half of the crowd and, and not the other. Um, yeah, as I say, I think the referees, they, they referee the game in good faith. You know, like everybody else, they might make mistakes. They look at VER, which is helping them, to be honest. They might look at VER and think, you know, I made the right decision. They might change the decision, whatever the case may be. But as I say, it's not malicious. They they give the decisions they think are right, and to mix that professional decision with private life's pretty uh, pretty disturbing. Yeah, roughly we spoke about it yesterday. Mm -hmm. No, nobody wants to see it, but now that the, the police are getting involved, are pretty confident and, and hopeful that those doing doing the wrong will be brought to justice. Yeah, I would like to think so. In the modern day, I would like to think the police have got the facility to catch these people. You know that, uh, and it's important that they do get caught you know and uh, we're made aware of what the punishment is because that's the only way you'll stop it you know and you can't have you know something like that going on you know the referees themselves would probably take it in the chin but when it starts affecting your family and your kids at school and all that you know it's it's, it's just not on so well done to the police for acting very quickly i know they'll they'll do it as quick as they can and uh, the way the modern technical stuff is you would bank on them getting it because they've got these specialised people who can really find these outrageous people. Yeah, one of the incidents that may have caused this stir was the um, disallowing of the goal scored by Alfredo Morelos in the first half for Rangers. Um, after the match, Rangers released a statement saying that they had written to the SFA asking for clarification or, or even looking out for an apology for the match. Um, they've since released a statement again um, last night um, reading, firstly, Rangers condemn in uh, the strongest terms any abuse of match officials. We are all passionate about our game, but targeted personal abuse of referees cannot be tolerated. The club can confirm the Scottish FA has responded with regards to the disallowed Alfredo Morelos goal, with the response claiming the decision, was, the correct decision, sorry, was taken. The club is a 
astonished by this, especially given most observers, including former referees and former players, could see no issue with the goal standing. This comes following a weekend in England where PG MOL have offered an apology to Brighton and Hove Albion for the non-award of a penalty in their match with Tottenham Hotspur, alongside a pledge to review the incident. While an apology does not alter the outcome of a match, such responsibility and openness would be welcome in Scotland. I'm glad I managed to get through that statement because Neil, I was struggling with the eyesight there. I had to, <laughs> I had to move to the, It's actually quite far away, but in all seriousness, um, look, looking back on that, do you think Rangers had a point to, to write to the SFA in the first place? Um, in my opinion, not really. I mean, they're looking for an apology, but you can't get an apology if you think what you've done is right. I mean, that, that just doesn't happen, you know. And like most people, you can watch that incident a number of times. And there's arguments for and against, you know, both players are at it, so do you let them at it and Morelos goal stands? Or does Alistair Johnson pull Morelos in the box, the same as Morelos is pulling him in the box? Is it a penalty? Or is it a case of just the first one that falls down and gets the decision? You know, Carter Vickers had a penalty in the same sort of circumstance against Hibbs. Both Hanlon and Carter Vickers were pulling each other's jerseys. One fell down, got a penalty, Morelos didn't on this occasion. Johnson gets a penalty, but I think if you're looking at it, Morelos does push him at the end, just before there's contact with the ball. And, you know, you can look at it a variety of ways. The referee's looked at it his way, and he's made his decision. Is it the wrong decision? Some people say yes, some people will say no. But you can't apologise for a decision you think's right. Is that the issue with it, Ruffy, that everything seems to be subjective, even with VAR, it's not, yeah. it's, it, it doesn't really clear up an incident like that. There are, as we've said, arguments for and against awarding the goal or not awarding the goal. Yeah. Well, well, Rangers have found people who thought it should have been a penalty. <laughs> yeah. no, they haven't found anybody that did they agree with it, you know, and that's what's happening. There, there are two ways you look at it, you know, I, I, I already said yesterday, it was a wee bit like what Neil said there. I don't, I, I, Neil, I don't think there was a push. I think there's this new word that you use, contact. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there was a contact in the back of his back. They were pushing and shoving, there's no doubt about it. But I think the final bit, Morelis puts his hand on his jersey. Is it enough to throw him on the ground? I don't think so. But the modern day player now, if they think there's a contact, if it was up on the other end, you know, in a penalty box for a penalty situation, the, and somebody said, why did you dive? And they'll go, oh, oh there's contact. Yeah. You know, so you got you, you either look at it, obviously, if you, you're Rangers camp, you, you definitely think it's a goal. You know, you're not, going, you're not going to not look at it that way. But there are people out there who have another opinion. And Rangers have now got a, 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 a statement from the SFA. And, and, and Hugh summed it up yesterday. They said, uh, the referee didn't think it was a penalty and the VAR boy didn't think it was a penalty so it's not a penalty and that's not a goal sorry so you have to move on you, you can't be hanging about you know and uh, again we spoke about it yesterday I thought Rangers played particularly well I thought they should have got something out of the game you know but I think Rangers have now got to keep everybody on board you know there's a big game coming up could keep the fans on board we're, this is the way we're thinking and I think that's the way that Rangers are going at this particular moment so they're doing it for the club and the supporters, so so why wouldn't you? Yeah. You know, Rangers were looking for an apology. Is that a dangerous game to play if, if the SFA start dishing out apologies for incorrect decisions? There's arguments that that may lower the credibility of, of, of the referees and the, the, the VAR technology. Is that a dangerous road to go down? Yeah, it probably is. And again, it's maybe another reason why the SFA haven't apologised for this incident or maybe others um, in the season. Uh, I think once you open the floodgates, then there's no stopping it. Um, so yeah, maybe it's just a stance that they take and they back their employees and they back their referees. Yeah, there was an apology issued to Brighton for the incidents in the, the Brighton and Ove Albion game and, and the Spurs game. Did you see the highlights from that match? Yeah, I saw yeah, that, yeah. That's yeah, I mean, but the, best, the individual... That one must be justified because that, that game was, yeah. a, that was a robbery. Yeah, yeah, it certainly was, you know, but I mean, I don't think this particular one was as, as bad, but as Neil said there, if, I mean, not just Rangers and Celtic, say like Hibs and Aberdeen and everybody's not happy with a referee, do you just... I want an apology for that, I want an apology for that, you know, they just, you've got to deal with it, the deal's already touched on it, the referee's doing his best, he's not going to get it right all the time, you know, you've just got to give him a bit of slack, you know, and that's why VAR's up there, now, if VAR, they go, if he, he goes to VAR and VAR say, are you perfectly red, then let's, let's get on with it. 
You know, we might not disagree with Neil, mate, you might, but we all we all have got a, a, a comment on it, you know, and you have to, at the end of the day, it's done and dusted. You can't bring it back, it's gone. Yeah, just we'll go one final question on, on this, because it's, it's the third day in the row we've spoken about this incident. Go or no go? Neil? Um, Ellis? I think I would have given it from the point of view that both of them are wrestling with each other in the box and one's weaker than the other. So I would have allowed, allowed the goal to stand. Ruffy? I no, you before, like, yeah. no, I think it was contact. I, I just think it was minimum contact. And that's what the, the referee's right in line with, it and he sees the player falling down there. Players, to fall down the way he fell down, the referee's got to be looking at it and going, there must have been something there for that player to, to, to fall forward like that. So he's made the decision. My argument, counter argument, slightly counter argument to that is that both of them are pulling each other's jerseys. Yeah. So, at which stage is the one yeah, committed to fill and the other? Is it the first, is it the last? Is it who goes down first? It, yeah. It doesn't? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think the, the contradictions here and the, the, the conflict shows the, the ambiguities of the, of the rules and, and the, the incident itself. So, um, we'll leave that one up to, up to the viewers in the, the comments. I'm sure they'll let us know whether um, our pundits have got that one right or wrong. If you're gonna right or wrong, do you think, uh, at Hearts? They got the right decision to, to get rid of Robbie Nielsen there? Um, I think it's the wrong decision, actually. Uh, I think if I'm um, Robbie Nielsen, I would be very disappointed. Um, I don't know if be, feel being betrayed is a harsh word. Um, but, you know, given the fact he, he did get Hearts back up the table in his second spell, he's had two Scottish Cup finals, finished third Europa uh, Conference League money. Um, the teams, by and large, played well this season to sit in third place for most of the season. Okay, a sticky six weeks or so. and and now two points uh, below Aberdeen, but is that really shaping his tenure, you know? And, and given the fact that he's, he was a manager previously that had the, the team sitting second and third in the league um, and all that he's achieved for Hearts, I think, um, like we know in football anyway, there's not a lot of loyalty, but I think it shows a, a lack of loyalty from Hearts, to be quite honest. Ruffy, do you think that this is maybe a panic reaction? It's been six weeks or so, but it's, it's not gone great. But as you know, summarised, it's they've been excellent under Robbie Nielsen for for eighteen months prior to that. Yeah, I, I, I agree hundred percent with Neil that uh, everything he said there. I would I would stand by him. I think he's amassed a few brownie points, you know, to at least see through a derby game and another game. Uh, and then you can assess how that. I mean, the next two games are they going to define Hearts' of season? You know, because there's other games that are going to be played. I think there've been a breath of fresh air this year. I think some of the signings, right up until the five games that they've lost, have been good. I think they're the only team in the SPL that have challenged Rangers and Celtic. They're the only team that's had a go at them. You know, so from that aspect, I would say, you know, yeah, I thought he should be given more time, but. I, I, I just think the fans have got so much say now. Fans, I mean, particularly the Hearts fans, you know, being the Hearts Foundation and the money they put into the club. I think the the board, who have obviously got supporters on the board, are reacting to the the massive crowd that they've got. You know, that's obviously went against them a while. Well. They've got 16, 17,000 supporters and they're all screaming for the manager's head. When I mean, you're on the board, you've got to sit down and have a discussion. You know, they're not happy. You know, what do we do about it? You know, and then, I mean, I'm led to believe that you obviously have a vote on a board. I don't think it was a unanimous vote, but it did go against them and uh, he'll have to deal with it, you know. But, uh, you know, I, I personally, myself, I, th I thought he'd done enough as everything that Neil had said there to, to get a stay of execution, you see. I, I, I mean, I know I'm old school now, but I, I judge a manager on the end of the season. You know, unless it's disastrous. Yeah. You know, he's not won a game for like 12, 13, as some, some teams in this league have done. You know, and you either make a decision to get rid of them or not. I, I tend to think, if you have a great season, you know, for a first first phase, second phase, and don't have a don't have a, a good ending of the season. Count your points at the end and see where you are, and, and then decide. You know, are you happy with what he's done, or are you not happy? I just think there's this reaction that uh, they don't look at the bigger picture. Uh, well, I, I think that you know, as Ruffy says, you know, it's it's entirely that, and I think 
In this modern day and age, it's fans, fans that get managers a sack. It's not boards as such, they, they pull the trigger, but it's pressure from fans, you know, and, and again, you can ask a question is, is uh, does that mean that fan ownership's good? Or is it a negative? Because Don't get off your started on that now. <laughs> because, because people on boards of fan owned, fan owned clubs are influenced by supporters or supporters groups. You know, so you know, there's no right and wrong answer. People say it's good or it's not so good, but it's just a question in this case, for example, is it fan pressure that got Robbie the sack rather than his actual performance? Yeah. It could be. I was out speaking to Hearts Chief Executive Andrew McKinley this morning at Tynecastle at his press conference. Um, he was speaking about the sacking of Robbie Nielsen and just how tough that decision was to make. Yeah, a really difficult decision, as we've said, uh, and a lot of discussion around, you know, is it the right decision? And obviously we want to give ourselves the best opportunity in those last seven games of finishing third in the league. We know what comes with that, and it's, it's very important to us. I think it's fair to say that over the last number of weeks, it, it's not a, a knee-jerk or gut, gut decision that was made just on the back of one result. Um, over the last few weeks, the results have been poor. Um, but I think also the performances have, have, have left quite a lot to be desired. And uh, we got to a stage where it was hard to see how we were going to be able to turn it around. Andrew McKinley, very transparent this morning, very yeah. open and honest. The, the fans would like to see that, roughly, that a, a, a member of the board is coming out and, and facing the press. Because there's been a lot of sackings in the Scottish Premiership this season. I don't quite maybe Dave Cormack after the, the Aberdeen Hibs game is, is another one but it's it's refreshing to see uh, a board so in touch with with the fans and Mills Hearts, Hearts have always been in touch you know, yeah. particularly with Anne Budge I mean if there'd been any trouble in the in the terrace and she's put her foot down right away if there's been any bad press that's affected Hearts she's jumped in it right away and again he's come out and, and gave an opinion you know I'd, I'd be interested in see what the majority of the fans think you know because it's okay saying yeah that the fans weren't happy with the way we were playing. How many are we talking about? A thousand, two thousand, three thousand? There's sixteen thousand there, you know. Sometimes you don't take yeah. the collective in, you know. And Neil's touched on it there. When when the abuse gets directed, particularly at the board, that's when you see things happening, you know, because they are of the opinion we have to keep all the supporters on board, which is quite right, because they're the ones that are buying the season tickets, they're the ones that are, are turning up. you you just got to be, sometimes you've got to be strong to say, look, this isn't as bad as what it looks like. You know, but everybody's got a different opinion. Do you think that's amplified now with social media? Yeah. They can they can maybe yeah. hear and, and see the reaction from fans more and, and those who are in you support. You, you, you don't really hear the ones the ones that are in support. They're no, not as loud, yeah. You just hear the segment who don't, don't fancy them, but they have they fancied them for a long, long time. And, and Neil's already put a case forward for the record that he's had. Just because you don't like the guy, or you don't like you, the chap there saying they don't like the way they're playing. They were playing, they were third in the league. You know, they were better than every other team in the league up until five days, five games ago. So he must have been doing something right. Yeah, you Neil, know, this morning when speaking to Andrew, he was, he was, he was talking about the importance of of finishing third, that seems to be of utmost important to Hearts. They said that that's where Hearts should be and that's where they should be every season. Is that now maybe a dangerous precedent to set that um, managers that succeed Robbie Nielsen will also be tested against <laughs> the same measure of success that it has to be third every season or it's a disaster? Yeah, but I think that's hard for their uh, successor, to be quite honest. You know, you look at Derek McInnes and even Jimmy Caldwood before that at Aberdeen, finishing the third, playing Europa League. Europe League group in terms of Jimmy's case, getting to cup finals, okay, maybe not winning cup finals regularly, but the one that comes next doesn't do any better, you know, and it takes him a while to transition. You know, Hearts, hopefully they've got, you know, Nasey, if he gets the job full time, as I say, he understands what Hearts is as a club, he understands the players, maybe there'll be an element of continuity, he'll change things around a little bit in his favour, what he seems they think he wants to improve and they might get third place again but you never know you need to be careful what you wish for sometimes um, and sometimes a change isn't always the right move and the thing about it is it's okay saying uh, hearts need to be third it's Robbie Nielsen that got them into that mentality they were in a championship you know I think they, were, they, weren't, they weren't saying then we need to be the third force in Scotland. Robbie got them there. Robbie got them into the Premiership. Robbie brought in players that made them 
third made them a team in Europe. So he, everything that they're wanting now, Robbie Nielsen actually got them to the position that they are a team that should be third. So surely he's got to get something. I, I think it was, it was put to uh, the chief executive this morning as well that the reason perhaps for that expectation is the fact they've got the third biggest budget. They've spent the third most amount of money. Do you think that necessarily always equates to, to, to the same success on the pitch? No, I don't think so. I mean, I would have think Aberdeen and Hibs would be up. I don't think they're far away, to be budget. fair, yeah. They'd be up with a good budget as well. So, you mean, I mean, I know Aberdeen have, have sacked their manager and they've got that wee rub of the green. But as Neil said, it doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't all the time. I mean, if, 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 just say Hibs, the Hibs Hearts game at the weekend, say Hearts were to go there and win 3 nothing. what does that say? A bit, a bit Robbie Nielsen, what does it say? You know, it's, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but uh, these are the things you've got to take into consideration. I think the good thing as well is, you know, it's good that clubs have got ambition to finish third. Hibs, as Ruffy says, Hibs will have the same ambition. Aberdeen's got the same ambition to finish third. So having that competitive nature of the game is great, but also you have other clubs. Livingston can finish in the high position potentially qualify for Europe, St Johnson win a couple of cups, Motherwell uh, doing well in, in previous seasons, so it just goes to show you don't need to have huge budgets to make an impact also. Do you think that's that added carrot now of finishing third that it, it, it never used to be that third place would get that Europa League playoff position and, and guaranteed Conference League group stage football if they fail, fail to come through that playoff, do you think now that's putting more pressure on teams like Hearts and Aberdeen and Hibs to see the money they can make? Hearts have already had a taste of it to think, well, oh, we need to make a change because we need to finish in that position. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the rewards are there for, for the clubs to finish third, there's absolutely no doubt. Um, and again, it's, I think it's a good thing because it does fuel competition and investment in the squads, I suppose, because a lot clubs might think a bit of investment in the squad will get them uh, the third place uh, finish. But again, if I'm speaking about it, I think Rangers and Celtic have got them, that third place finish, uh, and the chances are riches. So, again, it's it's improving the uh, the quality of football, I think, over across the board. Ruffy, Stephen Naismith, former PLZ yeah. pundit, in charge until the end of the season. Yeah, proud for the yeah, wee man yeah, that used to sit here. He's been on the show, you know, for a whole year, and uh, his ambition was to go into coaching. He said it on the show on numerous occasions. He wanted to be a manager at uh, some stage. I think he's went through the proper procedure, obviously, with the Hearts B team. He joined the Scotland national team. You know, a lot of experience there as well. So, no, I think Hearts have identified him, you know, as... Uh, to take them to the end of the season. I would like to think maybe possibly Gary Locke would be brought into that scenario. You know, Gary has obviously been the manager there, been the player. They're the kind of guys you want at this moment in time. So, no, I think Stevie will do well. He's very focused on everything that he's done. And now uh, he's under the pressure to get them in third place. <laughs> well, Andrew McKinley was speaking about the interim appointment of Stephen Naismith this morning and the potential of extending that beyond the summer. It's up to Stephen to show us how much of a serious contender he is. He is he's been put in charge, and um, you know, a massive opportunity for him. I think anyone that's given that opportunity is always going to be in in contention. Um, but it would be silly of us to say, right, we'll wait until after the seven games, and then oh, it's not worked, so we'll now. So we have to we have to sort of parallel things at the moment and look at various alternatives as you'd as you'd expect us to do. Neil, would you back the appointment of Stephen Naismith beyond the summer if, of course, granted he, he does well in these next seven matches? Yes, I would. As I say, he's a young manager. Ruffy uh, mentioned he's cut his teeth uh, with the B team, knows the club inside out. I'm pretty sure he'll be able to get a tune out of the players in terms of motivating them to play. Uh, one thing I would say, though, is you know, you look at it, after the split, you've got Rangers, Celtic, Hibs, Aberdeen. Conceivably, he might not win a game. You know, he might win five, he might win... So what, at what point do you measure success? What, what point do you think, yeah, yeah, he's the guy that's going to take well, us forward? On the flip from that, if he does manage to get them at the third by getting results against Rangers, Celtic, potentially two more Edinburgh derbies, does that even add more fuel to the fire as to why he should be the next Hearts manager? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does. You know, I think that's it. It's a results-based game, and I suppose that's why Robbie potentially is paid the price, albeit given the length of time he's been there and what he did, maybe he shouldn't have. Um, but yeah, it's a results-based game and, and again, you know, derbies are special to the, the people that are involved in them. And maybe the games against Hibs will be the ones that will define how the fans and people in general react 
to any potential appointment. Would you agree with that, Ruffy? Because it's been a long time since Hibs have managed to, to beat Hearts in, uh, in an Edinburgh derby. They've been so dominant in that fixture for so long. If Stephen Naismith can come in out of nowhere and, and, and continue that that record, do you think that'll get the, the fans on board? Of course it will. I mean, we've already touched on it, you know, it's a be-all and end-all for some fans, you know, that uh, the, if they beat their, their, their rivals, everything else goes out the window. They, you, th you forget about all the bad games, you know, that's why I, the other day I was talking about the Rangers-Celtic game, the, the semi-final. Rangers, to win that, the, the rest of the season just binned. You know, that's it, that game is, you know, in the final, finishing the... The, the season we are cup and you're going away into the close season and, and you're, you're forgetting about all the bad results, you know, that's the one you focus on. But if, if that is a scenario, we'll be hoping Hibs are on the end the top six. So they don't have to deal with them. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think maybe Hearts have looked at the, the recent success of Motherwell and yeah, Aberdeen? They've, Aberdeen they've, they've yeah. sacked their managers, two interim bosses have came in and done brilliantly. Kettlewell's now the boss uh, got the job on a permanent yeah. basis. Do you think maybe looked at that and thought, yeah. fancy a bit of that? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. You know, when you sit down, I mean, I don't know how many people are on the Hearts board, but everybody will have a say. Everybody will have, uh, it's not necessarily they all agree. I mean, you're saying he did say they all agreed, but you have to take tons of things into consideration. And uh, it'll be interesting to see when Robbie, if Robbie releases a statement, what, what he thinks about it. But, uh, I mean, we've, we've given it from our point of view. You don't have to agree with it. But uh, from me being in the football inside, I, I think it was a bit harsh. And what he's done for the club, obviously, in the times when things weren't going particularly well, he stuck on in there, you know. There has been a certain element of fans just don't like him for their own reason. You know, they're seeing him week in, week out. But when any time I, I saw Hearts playing against anybody up until the last five games that they've lost, I think they've been a breath of fresh air. The players have got, you've got to understand that lost Craig Gordon, lost Halkett, lost Boyce, lost two or three others to injuries. So they, they haven't been at full strength. You would, you would have to say to yourself, if they were all there, they possibly wouldn't have lost their five games. You've got to take all these things into consideration when you make a decision. Yeah, we've we've uh, spoken also about fans and how uh, the fans might have had a part to play in his departure. But do you, do you think maybe the players might have had something to do in this. There was a question put to Andrew McKinley this morning who said that uh, people at the board have spoken to, to who they like about the appointment, but in your experience as a player, Neil, would players be consulted about managers leaving or, or joining anything like that? No, I don't think so. Totally no. left from it, just a board decision? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And unless you've got a club captain that's maybe particularly strong and he's got a, a connection with the board, maybe, but I, I think that's pretty far-fetched and few and far between. Um, and you know I think Hearts is a club which has got an ethos with the players you know they demand 100% effort you know sometimes they might not be the prettiest team to watch but they've got a real work ethic and I think historically that's really what they've been built on um, and I don't think the players have let the manager down in that respect you know I think they go out and they play and they perform to their 100% best as Ruffy mentioned you know if you deprive any team of key players they'll struggle a little bit and I think at points in the season, Hearts have had key players missing. And I think they've managed to stay in third place for quite a bit of time, given that fact. And maybe now it's just caught up in them. Yeah, I, think, you, I think the important thing you've got to think, of, because when, when a team doesn't win five games or whatever it is, the first thing that comes out is the, the old saying, he's lost the dressing room. You know, the players don't want to play for him. That's a thing you've got to find out. You've got to find that. So, I, I mean, I don't know who the senior player would be in the Hearts side. I mean, or Craig Gordon would be if he, wasn't, if he wasn't injured and that. So I would like to think the board have a, went down that road. Are you all happy with the training? Are you happy, you know, with his decision making? Are you happy with the dressing room? You know, they've got to take that into board and, and on board as well because football can just turn just like that. And uh, that's what they'll be looking for at the weekend. Well, if you said a moment ago it'd be interesting if Robbie Nielsen, see what he had to say. He's actually just released a statement now. We have a, a statement from Robbie Nielsen who said, I would like to thank Anne Budge and all of the board for giving me the opportunity to manage Heart of Midlothian over the past three seasons. We built a fantastic relationship and I always have the utmost respect for them. My thanks also go to the players and staff for their hard work and dedication. 
I've enjoyed working with you all and seeing you develop as both a team and as individuals. To my assistants, Lee McCulloch and Gordon Forrest, thank you for your unwavering support and dedication. Everything we've achieved together, winning the Scot Scottish Championship, two Scottish finals, a third place finish and securing European group stage football was uh, sorry, was with the superb support of the Hearts fans and the foundation of Hearts. I thank you all for that. I am immensely proud of what we are able to achieve together. It has been an honour to be your manager. I would like to wish everybody at the club the very best of luck as they seek to finish the season strongly and build on the strong foundations already in place. I'm now looking forward to having a chance to reflect, recharge and prepare for the next opportunity. Neil, reaction to that? Sounds like Robbie Nielsen, of, of course, naturally he'll be gutted, but doesn't sound like there's any bad blood between him and the club. No, I mean, I think that's due to the fact Robbie's long connection with the club as a player and manager twice. Um, you know, so he's obviously getting a, an affinity with the club in that regard, but obviously during the, the statement he's made clear his achievements while the Hearts manager in the last three years. Um, and it'll be a challenge for the next manager to continue to finish in third place every single year from now until infinity and maybe win a cup because it isn't that easy. Um, so yeah, I mean, Robbie's, Robbie's made his, his position clear in terms of he's probably done all he can, perhaps, to be quite honest. And not, not only has he put the next manager under pressure, he's put the board under pressure. Because the board are the ones that dictate, you know, the budget that, that they get, you know, and, and, and it, ca it can be twisted. You know, you, 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 you just don't have the, the mentality to be third. So they have to prove that they are and they're going to put everything in place for Hibs. For, sorry for Hearts for the next manager coming in. He says at the end it's time to reflect, recharge and look forward to the next opportunity. Yeah. Can you see Nielsen returning to management in Scotland again soon? He also never read out the PS. This is a shocking decision. <laughs> 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 I, I, don't yeah. think he, I don't think that would have been a, a smart PR move for Robbie. No, I think he's done enough in the game. You know, there's, there will be jobs come available. You know, and, uh, and what we've saw other managers who have been with top clubs maybe went abroad. We've seen Neil Lennon going abroad. It might be an avenue just to get out of it for a wee while and go to another country and experience something else. But uh, for me, he's not, he's not got a horrendous record. He's not, got, he's not got a record where if you were at a football club, you go, oh, we're not touching him. I think the record he's got, if you sit down and look at it, and Neil brought it up at the beginning of the show, it's pretty impressive to bring Hearts from where they were in the Championship to where they are now. In terms of his success on Neil Naismith's got the job now in the interim, any names in mind that you think should get the job permanently beyond the summer? I mean, I, I think you just give Stephen Naismith the opportunity, to be honest, to see how he gels with the players, what kind of uh, performances he gets from the players, what kind of results he gets, um, and then it's an easier decision for the club in a lot of ways. Um, rather than go and find the successor and the, all the costs that that entails. So I think uh, they maybe have to run with Stephen Naismith at the moment. Um, in terms of Robbie going forward, I think Ruffy kind of touched on it there. You know, it's unlikely he'll manage Rangers, Celtic, Hibs, you know, Hearts. So he's limited in where he can go in Scotland. It'd be perceived to be a smaller club, you might think. So, so maybe a, a coaching avenue abroad is something that's uh, going to be open for him. Yeah, we'd like to hear your thoughts as well in the, the, the comment section. Let us know in the live chat who you think should succeed. Robbie Nielsen, should it be Naismith beyond the end of the season if he proves his worth from now until the next seven matches? Ruffy, you got anyone in mind? I know you mentioned Gary Watt, but there's plenty of names being oh, heard. Stephen Robinson, uh, I think was another one, and um, Ham Craig Levine maybe. When Hamilton Ackies had a managerial uh, vacancy, there was 50 applicants. There'll be tons of people. McKinley said that this morning. He said he, he opened his emails and it was inundated There'll of CVs be tons already. Tons of people who are out of a job, and then you have to sift through them all, you know, and then you have to break it down. But uh, it'd be really interesting to see the calibre of a uh, manager who applies for this. Yeah. Um, just moving on from. Uh, the, the whole Hearts debate, I know we've discussed it at length, we'll have plenty of time for the rest of the week as, as, as that one develops and we'll look forward and preview the Edinburgh Derby of course taking place on Saturday at Easter Road. Special game tonight at Hamden Park as the Scotland women's national team take on Costa Rica. 
and, and international friendly. You know, just how great is it to give the, the women's side the, the platform and, and the audience to play at the, the National Stadium at Hampton? Yeah, it's great to, to play in the big stage, in the big pitch. And that's where they should be. Yeah, that's absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they, they deserve to play. They're a national team um, and they deserve to play in the national team stadium. Uh, and players respond to that, you know, the, the big pitch, the big occasion, the big venue. And I'm pretty sure uh, they'll thrive playing in such a uh, such a pitch. Yeah, roughly a big talking point for this one is the captain Rachel Corsi is is injured. We know that Claire Emsley took the the armband in the in the previous fixture, but it sounds like Caroline Weir might be taking the armband tonight. Real Madrid player, of course, she's on 97 caps, I think it'll be. Tonight, 13 goals and 19 from midfield as a Real Madrid player. Not bad for a Scotland player, eh? No, it's fantastic. Uh, and, and most of your girls now are playing abroad. Most of them are down south with yeah. top clubs, you know, big professionals now. And you can see that it's affecting the, the national side. They're now getting results. I mean, the, the, the scalpy is... Australia uh, last week there was a big one because they're, they're, they're not bad as well. But I think the disappointment of not qualifying for the World Cup will still be lingering because you've got to get to finals. You've got to get there to bring the, the youth attention and keep them all playing in that. And, and going to a national uh, tournament is fantastic. So they have to get back there. But I mean, if they keep winning games, the confidence will come. And the next competition will be coming up and they'll be hoping they can qualify for that. Yeah, Duffy's absolutely spot on. But we've got a number of younger players now involved in the squad. I think Jamie Lee Napier was brought in at the end of last week and there's plenty of young players now involved in, in addition to the to the number of players playing abroad in England and Spain and even America. Just what does that do for, for young girls wanting to, to grow up and play football in Scotland? Yeah, I think the... You know, women's football in Scotland at the moment is very positive. It's on the up uh, domestically. You know, we can see Rangers and Celtic Hearts to a certain extent, Glasgow City investing in the squads, competing to, to win the title. Um, and that, again, fosters a, a good level of competition amongst the other teams. Um, and the quality of the players improving year upon year. Uh, and as Ruffy said, you know, the vast majority play in the uh, in English league, uh, some abroad, of course, as well. And it, it just augurs well for the future of Scottish football. I think, you know, the, the Scottish game in general and the women's side is, is riding the wave of uh, investment and professionalism that the, the women's game is going through at the moment. Yeah, it's great to see the, the women's side now more recently doing so well and uh, the men's side as well. Roughly, um, looking at the, the men's side, there was some rumours today that they might be playing a little gra uh, glamour friendly um, against France in October, just after we play against Spain. Do you think that's a, a sign of the intent of Steve Clark? He's spoken at length in recent press conferences about wanting to test his players against the, the top opposition, because ultimately the goals are to qualify for tournaments. And when you get there, if you want to compete, you've got to beat these top sides. And by playing France, they're absolutely doing that. Yeah, I think it's good. I think the players will, will react to that as well. You, you want to play all the top clubs. You want to challenge yourself against the, the better players that are about, you know, and I'm sure the supporters would love it. You know, we've had great games against against France. That uh, the only the only downside, I say, you've got to watch when you play these fr these friendlies because it does affect your ranking points. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think that the friendlies did. I thought it was just your competitive games, but it also does. And we're in a right good place just now in, in the ranking. You know, we're now trying to get out of that third pot. You know, what makes it very difficult for you. So the more games we win, as we are doing, you know, the better it gets. Yeah, you know, there'll be some tough fixtures coming up. We're in the um, the, the top league A for for Nations League up against the, the best teams in, in Europe now getting friendlies against uh, France and a very difficult qualifying group with the likes of Norway, Georgia, and Spain. Could could this a tough year for Scotland? Of course, it's tougher for all the matches, but. Ruffy says you've got to be careful when you're organising these sort of things that you don't damage the confidence as well. I think one thing the Scotland team's got at the moment is confidence. You know, I've said it before, I think they've fostered a, almost like a club spirit at national team level, which is, is pretty important and it's key to winning games, or certainly not losing games. And I think you've got to test yourself against uh, the best players, especially if they are going up the, the, the pots or the, the groups in the Nations League. Eventually, they're going to have to play these teams anyway. Um, and again, I think we've got a good approach to matches 
in friendly games. Sometimes other teams don't really take it as seriously as, as we do. Uh, you know, so I would have no fears of Scotland playing against France in a friendly. And we'll have arguably the two best players in the world just now, or the two most exciting players in the world, Erling Haaland and Kelly Mbappe, both playing at Hamden potentially this year as well. Looking forward to that. Absolutely. <clears throat> you know, we spoke about it in a previous show about how you want to see stars turning up at, at Hamden. You don't always uh, or often get the chance to see them. You know, it was a long time ago, but I remember Zidane's goal at Hamden in the, the Champions League final. You know, and you don't often get to see these, these players perform in, in big stage or big games. So, yeah, more the merrier. Yeah, talking about Champions League, which is nicely onto our preview for the big matches tonight. Ruffy Benfica versus Inter Milan, Manchester City versus Bayern Munich. Finally, um, we, can, we can get some uh, get these fixtures on the screen for you just now um, for, the, for the full weekend. Of course, we'll start tonight in the, the quarterfinals of Benfica versus Inter Milan. Manchester City then host Bayern Munich, and then tomorrow Real Madrid will take on Chelsea and AC Milan versus. Napoli, Rafael, I'll start with Benfica versus Inter Milan. It's an interesting one because Benfica, seven clear at the, the top of their league, they've been going great, but they did lose at the weekend. Do you think that, that kind of spill from the domestic football could, could come into this one? Uh, no, I would forget about domestic football. I, I think Benfica have been knocking about Europe. I think they've been getting better year on year. Uh, tremendous. I mean, unfortunately, they lose some of their best players, but, you know, I think they're a, sort of a sneaky shout this year to get the semi-final uh, I don't think they'll win it but I think the, the progression of you know through the years of getting better and better in the European style of football you know they've been very very good so I'll be keeping my eye on that one but I think we're all looking at Napoli aren't we we all really want to see how really good they are you know and they're the, I mean I know they've had good results in, that, in their own league but I'd be really interested to see how they go on when they come up against one of the big ones. Yeah, you know, roughly saying that domestic football doesn't really come into it, but if you look at Inter Milan, they're winless in six. They just scraped by in the previous round against Porto and they've been really disappointing as of late. Do you think that will come in, into their minds at all tonight or, or is this a chance for them to save their season? Yeah, I think it's a chance to save the season. Yeah. Um, it's a big prize. Um, maybe, yeah, it's a distraction from the mundane week in, week out. And yeah, I mean, you, you beat Benfica who they would fancy their chances against, I'm sure, to secure a semi-final spot. And then once you get to that kind of level, you just never know. Yeah. Predictions for this one? Start with you, Rafa. I'm going to go with Benfica. I just, as I said, I have been really impressed with watching them. Uh, and the fans, it's a tremendous stadium, tremendous fans in the home games. So, yeah, I'm going to go Benfica. Yeah, brilliant in that last round. 7-1 on aggregate against Bruges. Neil, you the same? No, I'll go for Inter Milan. Go for Inter, yeah? yeah, yeah Why? Yeah. I just think Italian teams have got a knack of winning games, you know, and they hopefully they'll defend pretty well <laughs> and uh, they'll always have a chance to, to win, especially when they, they get them back at home. Yeah, we'll discuss Manchester City versus Bayern Munich in a little bit as well, but first we can hear from the main man himself, Pep Guardiola, talking about the pressure of the Champions League looming over his head. You are here to win the Champions League, it's come every single season, I understand that, so I had said many times. We tried last season, we tried two seasons ago, we tried three seasons ago, every single season. But there are teams that you face that also they are good too and they want to win it too. Ruffy, how important is finally a Champions League win for Pep Guardiola and his we're legacy? Annoy him now. <laughs> we're you can see annoy that. Him. People are now that. That is it. I mean, you can win the league and you can do this, but this is the big one. You know, this is the one that people are saying, "Oh, you, you've spent X amount of pounds. You brought him in. You brought him in. You know, when's it going to happen? You know." So he's not like you know, he's just like everybody else. He's under pressure to win this cup. You know, and he will be until he wins it. You know, and I'm sure him with the standards that he sets will we'll want to win it as quick as possible. He's get everybody off his back. He's won this one before, Neil. Do you think if he wins it with Man City, it'll be his proudest achievement yet? Because he's just not quite been able to do it in that last five or six years that he's been there. Yeah, I think it's difficult. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a cup competition when it gets to knockout stages, and sometimes you can just have a bad day at the office and lose goals that puts you out of the competition. So. You know, it's not. Sometimes it's easy to win a cup in certain sense. That you know, it's not over a long period of time. But in other ways, it's difficult um, because a bad day can can knock you off kilter. Uh, yeah, I mean, if he wins this, it will be a, a crowning glory at Man City. That's for sure. Um, and it also meant his place has been one of the top coaches, if not the top coach, around at the moment. Um, and yeah, again, I think over a period of time, they've 
developed into a team that's capable of winning the Champions League. They were so close to winning it before. So, yeah, I mean, if they get knocked out at this stage again, is, is it disappointing? Because they haven't reached the final? Probably. So, it's high stakes, you know, especially when you're playing against other big clubs like Bayern or Real Madrid or, or Chelsea or... You know, Napoli, for example. Yeah, up, up against tougher uh, opposition. Of, uh, of course, in Bayern Munich, had today Ruben Diaz, Manchester City player, was asked, does he expect to win the game? Because simply on the basis that the English Premier League is perceived to be a stronger league than the Bundesliga, you know, personally, mm -hmm. I think that's that's nonsense and that's quite arrogant from the English press to suggest that. But surely, surely these Man City players will not be taking a squad and a team like Bayern Munich lightly. Not at all. You know, obviously, the They've moved on Lewandowski, but they've got other players there. There are other players that other teams are wanting to pinch. Uh, and particularly in England, you know, would take a few of the buy-in players. So, you know, I think this is a massive game. This will be, you know, you look at Man City and, and this, this, against this particular team, you know, if they were to win, you know, at home and then maybe get, even win away from home. I've seen them winning away from home as well. Then other teams will now have to start and take a serious look. But they've got to come through it. They've got to you know, live up to the standards that they have, and they've certainly got Haaland. You know that goal he scored at the weekend again. You know he's just a, he's just a colossal, just a unit. You know he just everybody he just bats people all over the place. So they're relying on him, but they've got other players as well that are just as effective. Prediction tonight? Yeah. Yeah, I think they'll win two 0 tonight. Man City. Yeah. Yeah. Neil. 2-1, Man City. 2 Man City. Mm -hmm. agreeing, agreeing on this one. Um, tomorrow we'll see Real Madrid take on Chelsea. Um, a really difficult spell just now for Chelsea. Neil just sacked Graham Potter, Frank Lampard's there. And in the interim, could he potentially do the Roberto Di Matteo, if you remember back when they when they won the Champions League, he came in as a an interim boss? Um, in this occasion, I don't think so. I think in the past, at uh, that time, when Di Matteo was the manager, they had big personalities in the team, leaders. You know, I heard or read something by Mourinho recently talking about characters in his team that make a difference, like George Costa at Porto and John Terry at Chelsea, and these guys were important for him. I don't think Chelsea have got players like that at the moment. I think they've bought a lot of players with great potential, great talent, maybe younger ones, um, but I don't think necessarily they've got the big winners and leaders and personalities in the team that can, can reach the Champions League final and win it. Ruffy, would you, would you agree with that? Because if you look at the Real Madrid team, they're going to be coming up against the likes of Modric and Cruz and all these boys that have, and Valverde, Carvajal players that have been there and done it and won it year on year. Chelsea don't quite have those same players. No, I think Neil's perfectly right. I mean, uh, I think they have got a young team. It's not this year. It might not be next year either, but certainly in the years to come, if they can hold on to them. I mean, that was, that was what the Chelsea owners told Potter. You know, we want you to buy into young players. We're going to spend a lot of money, but it's not going to be immediate success, you know, and we're quite happy with that. And then all of a yeah, sudden, like them. he's out the door, <laughs> you know. But I know I think Chelsea are two years away if it's starting dominating European football. But uh, they've certainly got exciting players. Prediction for tonight? Uh, tomorrow night, sorry. Uh, is it Real Madrid, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, we've seen Real Madrid live, and it is. Now you don't need to rub it in, Ruffy. I know I got that one. I was, it is I was sent to Hearts instead. It's frightening. Uh, three nothing. Three nothing. Mm -hmm. To Los Blancos. They can, go, they can go to Barcelona and beat Barcelona four nothing away from home. Well, I was going to take Ruffy's three and raise it before. I'll go for four now. <laughs> yeah, the, the, certainly no confidence in the, the, the Chelsea camp on this couch. Um, that was our final match that will take place tomorrow. An all Italian clash at the San Siro as AC Milan take on Napoli. Ruffy, I, I know you, you're you loving Napoli this season. I mean, we saw Napoli against Rangers and they were just unbelievable, yeah. you know, particularly up front, you know. But again, you know, and they've done it in the league, you know, so they'll be getting into this game with a wee bit of confidence because they've already played this team and they'll know it. They'll know each other inside out, but I'm a wee bit like Neil, you know, big Italian teams with a pedigree have got, they've got a way to get through a tie, you know, but, so I think this is a big, big, biggest test for Napoli, you know, to get through this one. I wouldn't be surprised if it's nothing each and then one nothing somewhere. And, uh, but I, I, I can't put, a definite on this one, but uh, I think we'd all like to see Napoli 
going through because of the way that they play, they excite everybody. Yeah, you know, the last thing that Peter told me before taking over the show was to remain neutral, but I'm just going to go and say I really want Napoli to win the Champions League, simply because I was lucky enough to go to Naples earlier in this season and watch them play against Rangers, covering it for PLZ Soccer, and oh, see when you go to that city and you see the Maradona murals and walking around and just the love those people have for football and that man, it just, it just makes you fall in love with it, honestly. Looking at that, the whole culture around football, what would a Champions League win do for this city? Never mind the Scudetto that they're, they're about to win in a couple of weeks' time. Oh, it's huge. I mean, you, <clears throat> you look at the, the impact that Maradona's had, the legacy. I mean, that's what, 30 odd years ago, more. Mm. Um, but he's still revered and it still means so much to them. You know, for them to win the Champions League would be, be the same. You know, these players would become heroes. You know, there'd be murals all over the city, these guys, you know, so there's a big prize for them, the big carrot for them to go and win the Champions League. Um, have they got the players to do it? Possibly. But I still think when you reach the back end of the Champions League, you're coming up against teams that have got a culture of winning these tournaments like Bayern or Real Madrid. And I think you're up against that as much as anything else as well. Um, so, yes, I would like Napoli to reach the final and have a chance of winning it. Um, but I think it'll be pretty difficult for them. Yeah. They've got a good route to the final if they do win this tie against AC Milan. They'll play the winner of Benfica and Inter. Yeah. So you would consider them favourites for both this quarter-final and the semi-final. So, what's we'll your predictions for this one then? I've, I do have to say to you though, they did play each other a couple of weeks AC Mo a couple of weeks ago and AC Milan beat them 4-0. Yeah. Uh, so, Nap <laughs> that had Napoli as well, wasn't it? Was yeah, it, yeah. It, was, it was in Naples, they the won 4-0. So, uh, take that into consideration, if, if you will. But there is 22 points between the two teams in the league. I, I would think, uh, obviously, they, they, they've got to learn for that, that game <laughs> that they get thumb, so I think they'll be good enough to get a draw tonight. I think uh, Ruffy's assessment's fair. You know, I think these teams will be cagey in the first leg and also in the second leg, but I think the odd goal here and there will uh, make a difference. 1-0, one 1-1, one one, you know, there won't be too much in it between the two teams. Who's winning the full thing, Neil? Napoli. Napoli. Mm -hmm. Napoli for me, Napoli, yeah. yep. yep. I would absolutely love it if you're correct. Now, um, we've been spending the last 10, 15 minutes speaking about the Champions League, the top tier of European football and world football, but I have to talk to you about a game uh, I've seen the highlights of yesterday. I don't know if you know what I'm going to talk about, but did you see the Wrexham match between Wrexham and Notts County? No, no, no. The National League. It was on when we were doing the show yesterday. I went home and watched the highlights. Um, Wrexham won the game 3-2. Both teams were on 100 points each going into the match, pretty much a title decider, um, a promotion decider back into the Football Leagues with four matches to go after this one. 3-2 up in the 96th minute, Notts County get a penalty kick. Ben Foster is in goals for Wrexham, former Manchester United, West Bromwich Albion player. He's been out of, uh, he's retired, didn't play for the last eight, nine months, comes out of retirement and he's sec second or third game for Wrexham. This brilliant penalty save, last minute, pretty much wins them the league. And you see Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney, the Hollywood owners, surrounding him after the game. And it was just fantastic scenes. I, I, I want to talk to you about that because, roughly, first of all, great achievement for, for Ben Foster. But for this whole, excuse the pun, Hollywood story around the club from the ruins that we're in and having the, the Hollywood owners in, it's, it's great to see, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's good for Wrexham, you know, away way, 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 way back Wrexham were a good side with good mm. Welsh players, you know, uh, Wrexham used to have the nucleus of a Welsh team uh, way back in the 70s and the 80s, so they have got a bit of tradition, you know, and the, the two guys get in there, I'm sure the fans would would buy into that, you know, and obviously I would like to think they've pumped a few, few bob in at the club as well, which other clubs might think, well, oh, that's a bit unfair. You know, but that's the way football is just now. You know, if you've got good owners who are prepared to put money in and they get a bit of success, you can you know, only look at the the future. And obviously, he's as high as a kite. You know, the boy, he's, he's that high that he went and bought a £2 million <laughs> house that so was three, million, three mile for the club. So he's really buying into, you know, everything that they're doing. So, no, good luck to them. Uh, I think it'd be great. It's amazing to see how many teams have fallen out of that English league into their leagues. Yeah. So you get a chance to look at them, you know, the, a lot of clubs who 
a wee bit like our, like our game as well, you know, the, the clubs that have been in the second division for a long Beacon, time, Beacon, like Berwick, Sterling, Easter, Cowden, Beath and all that, that's happened in, in England as well and they're all thriving to get back in because them, like everybody else, realise that the money that's available once you get back in there, but yeah. uh, no, good luck to them. Neil, we've gone from Scottish football right up to the Champions League, back down to the National League, I'm going to take it down a step further again um, because we're actually going to take a, a little clip of watching myself play football um, we've got a, um, a little uh, challenge coming out at 5 o'clock on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel where I was given the opportunity to train with Livingston um, fair to say uh, if you've looked at social media today you'll have seen the official club account calling me out on Twitter for um, ruining one of their cones certainly uh, made a, a mess of it but our producer has kindly put in one of the, the good clips so just because I'm so full of myself here's a clip of me scoring against Livingston goalkeeper Shamal George at Livingston, the uh, PLZ Challenge, and I'm delighted to say the cream of Livingston Football Club is here to try and beat Ali Crawford's record of 7.4 seconds. And of course, shyness from PLZ, the greatest footballer never to be signed by anyone. Adam Binney is going to show the lads what to do. And then all these guys are going to try and beat the record, including the gaffer. Uh, I'm not, my back, my back, I would normally join him, but my back, my back is coming. So we're ready to go. Adam, show them the drill, halfway line. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh! <laughs> 11 seconds. Right, Bruce Anderson, he's got no chance. Yeah, fantastic finish from me, Neil, I've got to say. But of, of course I will. I'm sure the viewers will be desperate to see me making an absolute hash of it as well, which I do on the next attempt. Um, to the hilarity of Peter and David Martindale, so you'll be able to, to see that. But roughly, do you think you would have saved that one? Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, no, you know, off the post, very difficult to get. You know, that, uh, you know, you've got the choice of where you can put it when I mean, you're that close in. So, no, no, that was a good finish. Yeah, Peter, in that video you'll see gives me a very hard time for the next attempt. Um, well, he's away though, we will be hearing from the boss tomorrow as he's got an exclusive one-to-one -one interview with former Rangers and Scotland manager Alex McLeish. We're up a level again, Real Madrid in the final. But uh, the, the teams previously then they, they were sticky, you know. Yeah. Um, Apart from Watershy, Watershy was, um, you know, the the, the brilliant home performance 5-1 and I remember the Sir Alex used to invite the old pensioners in to watch training and stuff and get bring them in the back there was a wee room at the back and where he gave them tea and that and uh, one of them was waiting on me the, the day after the 5-1 and he said that away goal could be dodgy <laughs> Ruffy, you're just talking in the the break there when you were looking at that that screen, the conditions yeah. back then. It looked horrible on that night. They were horrendous. I think it rained from start to finish. You know, the the park turned up uh, pretty badly. You know, but uh, I think Aberdeen. I think the conditions suited Aberdeen that night. You know, but not to take any away from them. You know, they 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 all hung on in there and they got the just rewards at the end and. Uh, it was fantastic, all the, the scenes after it. Yeah, fantastic piece from Peter, which you'll be able to view on our YouTube channel tomorrow. We don't have a show tomorrow afternoon, so that will be taking place of it, but it's a, a lovely little piece all about looking back at Gothenburg and that heroic Aberdeen team that were victorious back in the day. Um, we will go back to our competition because, again, our lovely viewers have the opportunity to win a fantastic prize. And what better way to spend your afternoon than playing golf with Tam McManus against Alan Ruff and Frank McAvaney. This week's competition is a chance for you to play a round of golf with Tam McManus against myself and Frank McAvaney. To enter, you must subscribe to PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel and answer this simple question. Which World Cup did Frank McAvaney and Alan Ruff both play in? Good luck. Good luck. Yeah, we've spoken about football, tennis a little bit at the start. You a golfer much yourself? Um, <clears throat> not really. I used to play a lot when I was younger. Uh, two rounds a day during the summer holidays. 
Yeah. There you go. I was I was all right, and then I started throwing and bashing clubs, and I thought I'll, I'll, I'll give it a miss. Yeah, too too frustrating. Um, just before we go, we've got to conclude our quiz as well. We had a quiz question earlier, which you'll be able to see on screen now. Um, which two teams contested the highest scoring Champions League final ever? Now, this is so embarrassing. I sat and made that question. You both got it first time. It was that game, nine, 1960. Yeah. Um, Madrid won seven three against Eintracht Frankfurt. Do you know where it was? Hamden. Hamden, aye. Hamden, aye. <laughs> <laughs> this was the whole. This was, I, was, I, I looked at that. And obviously, this was. No, you're either. You can't this, expect this, it. This, I know. Did, did, but, they, did they beat Rangers? Eintracht beat Rangers, didn't they? Semi final? I think they beat Rangers quite heavily. Aye, it was a big do, and I think it was the semi final, wasn't it? Yeah, I think you might have. Did you know also, you probably do know this, but it's the highest ever attendance at any Champions League or European Cup fixture yeah. ever. 127,000 people. Amazing. At Hamden, uh, the, the biggest one ever. Roughly, do you remember the game? I think you were eight at the time. Yeah, no, I wasn't at the game, but I definitely remember it. Yeah. And unfortunately, it was in black and white. <laughs> uh, and uh, but both sides had fantastic players, obviously. They had Real Madrid, uh, they had thing with Di Stefano and Puskas and Gento, and they were just a wonderful side, you know. And if you ever get a chance to go to the Real Madrid trophy room, you'll see. From by the again, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> quite good to work because all the replica trophies are all in that stadium. Yeah. Fantastic. Sounds like a fantastic time to be alive. And well, that's all from us this afternoon on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any videos that are coming out. We've got that challenge with Livingston Football Club make, watching myself take on the players that's able, available to watch right now over on our YouTube channel. So make sure you get yourselves over there. And don't miss tomorrow's standing episode of the football show with Peter Martin and Alec McLeish.